ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ticket 7 official side event towards population aging in Africa. Current approaches in elderly care and lessons to be learned across continents. My name is Momoko and I'll be the MC for today. Now, first and foremost, I would like to invite Mr. Akio Okawara, President and CEO of JCIE, to make some brief remarks on behalf of the organizers. Oh, Mr. Okawara, please. あの、英語で喋りますんで、あのマイクまだの方ご用意いただければと思います。Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of the co-organizers, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Tikat Seven official side event towards population aging in Africa: current approach to elderly care and lessons to be shared across continents. Uh, today's event is jointly organized by the Kakenhi project team for future population aging in East Asia, uh, the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia area, Nagasaki University, and the Japan Center of International Exchange, JCIE, with tremendous support from the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research. Uh, at this point, it is my honor to welcome Her Excellency Dr. Awa Marie Kolsek, uh, former Minister of Health for the Republic of Senegal, and Her Excellency Dr. Katalia, uh, excuse me, Dr. Natalia Kanen, Executive Director of the United Nations Population Fund, uh, who uh, both of them will be speaking later. JCIE, as a non-profit organization, has been undertaking programs to address various global health issues, playing a catalytic role to facilitate international coordination. And in this context, the population aging issue has been one of JCIE's important project scopes in recent years. In 2017, we launched a program on healthy and active aging in Asia in cooperation with AREA, and in co close consultation with the Japanese government's Asia Health and Wellbeing Initiative, commonly known as AWI. As is well known, Japan is the most aged country in the world, and there are many lessons that could be drawn from Japan's experience in tackling aged-related challenges. Under AWIN, uh, we aim to promote regional cooperation that fosters uh, sustainable and self-reliant healthcare systems and work towards the goal to create vibrant and healthy societies where people can enjoy long and productive lives. Today at TICAD 7, in collaboration with Dr. Masuda's Kakenki project team, we are extending our scope to Africa. These are, there are over 100 official side events this week during TICAD 7 but as far as I know, this is the only forum dealing with the topic of population aging in Africa. So I believe uh, this is a significant event introducing us to the challenges that Africa will face with respect to aging in the uh, very near future. As the subtitle of this event suggests, the purpose of the session is to bring together key experts from Asia and Africa to discuss healthcare, social protection, and welfare issues, exploring the potential for sharing experiences and lessons across continents. With the contribution from speakers from various sectors, including policymakers, civil society representatives, and academicians, I am sure that today's dialogue will provide new insights and raise awareness that population aging is a challenge that Africa, just like Asia, will be facing in the coming years. In closing, I sincerely hope that today's event will bear a fruitful discussion and provide important steps towards information sharing and cooperation between Africa and Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Okawara. Now, it is my great pleasure to invite Dr. Natalia Kanen, Executive Director of the United Nations Population Fund, to 
Mr. Akio Okawara, President and CEO of the Japan Center for International Exchange. Ms. Reikyo Hayashi, of the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research. My dear sister, Minister Alamari Kolsek, Excellencies, distinguished guests and partners, good afternoon. At the outset, I would like to express our gratitude from UNFPA to the government of Japan for your leadership in bringing us together under the TCAT umbrella and also for highlighting the very important issue of population aging. There are some brilliant initiatives taking place around the world that focus on healthy, dignified, happy aging. And I would say that the Asia Health and Wellbeing Initiative, AWIN, is one such brilliant platform. It's facilitating regional cooperation in population aging. And I'm really happy to learn that an African health and well-being initiative is being spearheaded using some of that same blueprint. Population aging is actually no longer just a phenomenon in developed countries. Planning ahead means that we have to think about the current youth boom in developing nations, which will very quickly progress through the cycle of life and indeed in Africa we estimate that by the year 2050, around 80% of people who are age 60 or older will be living in what are now low or middle income countries. So the face of the world is changing. And aging is not only driven by falling fertility rates. What we have, and this is great news, is medical advances, health and nutrition improvements that are leading to longer lifespan. And the outcome of these great achievements has to be part and parcel of a discussion of social and economic development so that as we age, the quality of life also is maintained around the globe. And more and more governments are looking for advice and support from UNFPA on policies and on programs to address population aging and low fertility. And we're working with partners and demonstrating leadership by increasing support for demographic intelligence and policy advice. Next year, Census 2020, a very important year for this. Looking across the life cycle, what UNFPA also says is that part of our mandate is to make sure that every young person's potential is fulfilled. That's part of being able to contribute to your family, to your community, to your nation, so that by the time the life cycle brings you to older age, you will have had an investment in you so that you're prepared for that stage of life. Just to close, I would like to say that in this year, UNFPA is celebrating our 50th anniversary. So we are on the aging spectrum. And indeed, we're celebrating 25 years since the Cairo International Conference on Population and Development. And it was there that all member states, 179 of them, called for action. Action that is vital for a country's prospect for prosperity and transforming the way we look at population from just looking at numbers and statistics to seeing the faces of the people that are represented. And as we convene in Nairobi on the 12th to the 14th of November to celebrate 25 years since Cairo, we are asking people to come with commitments and population aging is one of the emerging issues that we will be discussing under the umbrella of demographic diversity. It has been said that aging is not lost youth. What it is, it's an opportunity to expand creativity and it's an opportunity to show our strength as advocates in this stage of life. So together, 
let us make a difference, let us project meaningful responses to population aging, including some of the pension strategizing that is happening in Japan at this very moment here. Let us learn from each other and let us advance the vision of health and happiness in the golden years of life. Thank you so much. Domo Thank you very much, Dr. Kanen, for your encouraging message. Now let us move on to the keynote speech. We are fortunate today indeed to have Dr. Awamari Kausa, State Minister of the Republic of Senegal and former Minister of Health for the Republic of Senegal, who will share with us the approaches taken by the Senegalese government to address population health, population aging in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Awamari Kausa. Mesdames et Messieurs, euh, chers orateurs, euh, chers participants à ce, cet événement important, euh, je voudrais euh, parler d'un sujet dont on nous a demandé de dire quelques mots et euh, je commencerai par trois PowerPoint qui nous montrent déjà la position de l'Afrique. La position de l'Afrique qui se trouve être le continent où la population a une expérience de vie la plus faible. C'est le continent où vous avez euh, la moyenne de la population qui varie entre 45 ans et 65 ans. Cela peut être comparé aux pays européens, aux pays au Canada par exemple, ou au Japon, ou l'Australie, où il y a une population vieillissante beaucoup plus nombreuse. Mais on ne s'arrêtera pas là. Il faut dire que dans les années 50, 1950, on avait... Alors, je vais vous montrer ça. On avait, euh, entre les populations des pays les plus développés et l'Afrique, à peu près 30 ans de différence. Mais tous les pays ont vu leur espérance de vie augmenter. Et aujourd'hui, la projection sur 2050 nous montre qu'il n'y aura plus que 15 ans de différence. C'est dire que le vieillissement de l'Afrique est en cours et qu'il faut en tenir compte dès maintenant. On regarde la pyramide de vie. Nous avons par âge une pyramide qui existe toujours dans les pays en développement, notamment en Afrique, et une pyramide qui a complètement changé de forme avec le maximum de personnes entre 25 et 35 ans. Alors qu'en Afrique, c'est toujours les jeunes qui sont là. Il y a de plus en plus de sujets âgés, et comme ailleurs, nous voyons aussi qu'il y a plus de femmes que d'hommes âgés. Nous devons donc anticiper, anticiper sur cette croissance et c'est pour cela que les personnes qui s'occupent de santé mais également d'action sociale se tournent régulièrement vers les gouvernements et leur demandent quoi faire. Et les gouvernements aussi, nous, nous attendons tous à ce que les gouvernements mettent en place des politiques, des stratégies, des plans d'action qui permettent de soutenir les personnes les plus âgées. Ce qui veut dire que les gouvernements auront un double challenge. Celui des populations jeunes, qui est le challenge classique, normal. Les populations jeunes pour lesquelles il faut une meilleure santé, il faut de l'éducation, il faut de l'emploi. Mais en même temps, puisqu'il y a un vieillissement de la population, nous devons aussi tenir compte de ce vieillissement-là. Merci de nous inviter à votre événement, madame la directrice exécutive, parce qu'effectivement, parler de vieillissement, c'est un sujet d'actualité en Afrique aujourd'hui. Les euh, autorités, qu'elles soient politiques ou euh, sanitaires, ont toutes dit que progressivement, les sujets âgés deviennent une priorité. Et certains pays, comme l'Afrique du Sud, le Bénin, le Sénégal, 
mais également le Nigeria, ont développé des, prix, des plans d'action qui sont en rapport avec les recommandations de la seconde assemblée mondiale sur le vieillissement qui a eu lieu en 2002, mais également les recommandations de l'OMS en matière de santé. Mais il y a des choses concrètes qui se font. Aujourd'hui, en Afrique du Sud, il y a la création d'une pension pour les sujets âgés, différente de la pension pour les retraités. D'autres pays comme le Sénégal ont préféré parler d'accès gratuit aux soins. Il y a beaucoup d'expériences en Afrique que nous ne pouvons pas dérouler ici, mais juste pour vous dire que c'est un terrain qui va être exploré et pour lequel il y aura énormément d'avancées. Quand on parle maintenant du Sénégal, presque comme dans les autres pays africains, on va voir que le problème, la prise en charge des sujets âgés est liée à des mécanismes et à des dynamiques sociales qui sont très différentes de celles que l'on observe dans les pays développés. Traditionnellement, en Afrique et au Sénégal, les sujets âgés sont au centre de la famille. Ils sont, ce sont des personnes qui sont les gardiennes de l'héritage collectif et de nos ancêtres, mais également des valeurs religieuses. Et ce sont des personnes respectées et qui ne sont normalement jamais discriminées. Mais ces perceptions et ces représentations autour de l'âge et du handicap qui va suivre euh, est en train de changer. Prenons l'exemple de cette vieille dame cette femme âgée qui dit qu'en Afrique, il y a une réelle solidarité avec les sujets âgés, mais les traditions sont également en train de se perdre. Et donc, au Sénégal, on a observé, les anthropologues se sont rendus compte que nous avons un déclin de la solidarité, des réseaux de solidarité communautaire, une distance entre les générations, et les dépendants apparaissent parfois comme étant vraiment un problème, particulièrement dans les villes, mais également un défi pour les familles. L'appui qui est apporté aux personnes âgées est fragmenté et segmenté, en fonction des possibilités, mais également des rôles de chacun. Par exemple, un sujet âgé de sexe masculin sera prise en charge dans la toilette et autres par sa femme, surtout quand elle est beaucoup plus jeune, ou par son fils aîné, ou en tout cas un garçon de la fratrie. Quand il s'agit de la mère, c'est surtout la fille aînée qui s'en occupera. Mais de plus en plus, dans les sociétés où on a un peu de moyens, on voit qu'on prend des gens qu'on paie pour s'occuper des vieilles personnes. Il y a un changement qui se passe. Mais également, le style de vie ayant changé, il y a beaucoup plus de maladies chroniques qui se développent et des maladies donc liées aussi à l'âge. Mais très peu de personnes au Sénégal qui sont des personnes âgées, moins de 20%, ont accès à des pensions et souvent sont déconnectées des structures de santé spécialisées. Quelles sont les stratégies Elles sont nombreuses au Sénégal, mais nous avons mis en exergue certaines. Et nous reviendrons sur notamment le plan Sésame et un projet spécial qui s'appelle Rama et qui est un projet qui est au niveau communautaire. Mais sachez qu'il y a beaucoup d'exemples de, de stratégies dont la gratuité et la subvention de, certaines, de certains produits ou de certaines de certains médicaments, comme pour le diabète, l'insuline, c'est vrai que c'est surtout les enfants qui l'utilisent, mais chez l'adulte et chez le sujet âgé, ça peut être aussi utile, c'est subventionné. La dialyse est gratuite, déjà pour tout le monde, donc les sujets âgés en bénéficient. Et les médicaments contre le cancer sont euh, subventionnés au niveau des structures publiques. Voilà donc les choses qui se font. Et le secteur privé est aussi impliqué de plus en plus avec des consultations pour des personnes en fin de vie ou bien euh, des consultations à domicile et prises en charge à domicile. Quand on parle de plan Sésame au Sénégal, 
c'est un plan qui s'adresse aux personnes âgées. Et chez nous, on parle de âgés dès 60 ans. Et 60 ans, dès que vous avez 60 ans, vous pouvez avoir la consultation gratuite, les médicaments essentiels, les examens paramédicaux, les, euh, les procédures donc, chirurgicales et médicales et les hospitalisations. Mais qu'en est-il réellement On a fait une étude au niveau d'un centre de santé gériatrique qui a permis de passer en revue 3, 203 patients qui sont venus en consultation avec une moyenne d'âge de 68 ans et plus de femmes que d'hommes puisqu'il y a 59% de femmes donc une notion de genre est à prendre en compte. La, les, les maladies les plus fréquentes étaient l'hypertension, les cataractes, les arthroses et le diabète. Mais nous avons observé que on dit que le, le, la prise en charge est gratuite, mais dans les faits, nous nous sommes rendus compte que beaucoup de choses sont encore payantes. Pourquoi ces choses sont payantes C'est parce qu'il y a d'abord une difficulté à cibler les personnes bénéficiaires. Nous avons normalement, quand on parle de personnes bénéficiaires, nous avons euh, euh, les personnes qui n'ont pas de pension les personnes qui sont dans le secteur informel. Mais en général, tout le monde vient. Ce qui fait que le nombre qui était prévu et le nombre que nous recevons est beaucoup plus important. Il y a souvent des euh, ruptures de stock de médicaments génériques. L'absence de générique quand on parle de maladies chroniques, très souvent il n'y a pas de générique. Et les délais de remboursement pour les structures, puisque l'État doit payer, c'est gratuit, mais quelqu'un paie, c'est l'État. Et souvent, il y a des retards. Donc, certaines structures n'acceptent pas les sujets âgés parce qu'elles disent qu'on a une dette trop importante. C'est pour ça que le président Macky Sall, président de la République, qui a trouvé ce plan Sésame en place, a décidé de le lier maintenant à la couverture sanitaire universelle, qui est financée, ce qui permet d'avoir les moyens pour ce plan Sésame. Le projet Rama est un autre projet du ministère de la Santé et de la Première Dame, la fondation de la Première Dame, Servir le Sénégal, et qui veut améliorer le bien-être des sujets âgés, notamment ceux qui sont vulnérables au plan de la santé et sociale. Identifier ces jeunes par les relais, ces sujets âgés par les relais communautaires. Les médecins, les infirmiers viennent au niveau communautaire après quand ils sont identifiés pour voir les problèmes de santé et les problèmes nutritionnels. Une approche aussi psychosociale et émotionnelle est faite. Et on a une amélioration qui se fait au niveau de l'environnement du sujet âgé. Par exemple, l'équipement par des supports, avec par exemple des chaises roulantes, des béquilles, des choses que ces sujets n'ont pas. Et cela leur, les bloque dans la maison et leur permet, ne leur permet pas d'être mobiles. Ça, ce sont des choses qui sont prises en considération. Le support euh, avec des consommables, comme des kits d'hygiène, comme des, des, des aides pour ces personnes âgées. Et des toilettes, même des toilettes. Il y a certains, euh, certaines maisons où les toilettes ne sont pas adaptées au sujet âgé. Et ce projet les aide dans ce sens-là. Je voudrais tout de suite, après ça, passer aux recommandations. C'est vrai qu'on a beaucoup de choses à dire, mais puisqu'on n'a que 15 minutes, on, on a parlé de l'Afrique, on a parlé du Sénégal. Quelles sont les recommandations que nous voudrions faire Il faut d'abord adopter une, une approche, surtout communautaire, qui euh, renforce les familles. Une approche holistique, ce n'est pas seulement une approche médicale, mais tous les aspects autres, sociaux, environnementaux sont à prendre en considération. Et former des personnes euh, qui ont une spécialisation un peu en gériatrie. Renforcer les systèmes de santé, surtout d'une manière décentralisée. Inclure la, dans la liste des médicaments essentiels les médicaments pour les personnes âgées. Intégrer la, le vieillissement dans les programmes de santé et autres, comme la vaccination, comme la nutrition, la, euh, 
quand on parle du sport, toutes ces choses-là doivent être prises en considération. Et enfin, qu'on ait vraiment un financement approprié. C'est bien beau d'avoir toutes ces stratégies, mais il faut les moyens. Et cela, je lance un appel aussi, non seulement aux États, mais également à tout, euh, tous les, les acteurs qui soutiennent nos pays. Parce que cela est important, on a plus facilement de financement pour les jeunes, pour les femmes, mais pas beaucoup pour les sujets âgés. En conclusion, bien qu'au Sénégal, il y ait environ 5% de personnes âgées, si on parle de 65 ans, mais plus quand on dit 60 ans comme chez nous, euh, et donc ce nombre est en train d'augmenter. Et c'est dire qu'on doit avoir des, des stratégies qui sont adaptées à notre contexte socio-économique et culturel. En Afrique et au Sénégal en particulier, on a même des proverbes qui parlent d'une manière très élogieuse des sujets âgés. Par exemple, un sujet âgé qui meurt, c'est une bibliothèque qui brûle. Un sujet âgé, est le ciment de la communauté. Il y a donc beaucoup de choses encore à faire, mais surtout, apprendre des autres, apprendre des, des pays qui sont déjà passés par là, il ne faut pas s'enfermer dans ce qu'on croit être le bon, mais essayer aussi de s'ouvrir à d'autres, parce que cela nous permettra d'aller de l'avant et d'aider les personnes âgées. Je voudrais donc remercier les organisateurs de nous avoir donné cette opportunité de pouvoir partager avec vous cette expérience et vous dire que nous sommes à votre disposition, comme je l'ai dit, être ouvert et permettre à nos sujets âgés en Afrique de bénéficier d'une prise en charge adéquate et tenant compte de nos cultures et de nos valeurs. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Dr. Kassa, for the inspiring speech. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Prafula Mishma, Regional Director of Africa HealthAge International, to share with us about social welfare systems to protect the older persons in Africa. Dr. Prafula, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it, is, it is a real honor to be standing here and speaking to you uh, about uh, population aging in Africa. Um, there, is a, there is a paradox. Um, paradox it is a paradoxical situation we are talking about. They say in Japan, people cannot stop talking about population aging. And in Africa, people cannot talk about population aging. And they do not talk about population aging. So, so it is a real honor, therefore, to be speaking about population aging in Africa. Um, I want to first uh, thank uh, and uh, give my regards to Dr. Okawara from uh, the Japan Center for International Exchange, uh, Dr. Riko, uh, Madam Minister uh, from Senegal, Professor Ken Masuda from Nagasaki University, and, uh, and distinguished uh, panel members. Um, my, my presentation is, uh, we'll try to look at the issue and we will try to reflect on the issue of population aging, but specifically talking about social protection and health and the linkage between the two. So I will try to speak to the time. Um, thank you. Uh, I think already it has been said by, by Dr. Natalia and uh, Madam Minister in Senegal that Africa is expected to see a large population increase uh, in the next, uh, next uh, 20 to 30 years. In fact, it would increase by, 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 by four times, uh, from around 60 million now, it will become almost 225 million by the year 2050. Uh, but, but one of the things that we must keep in mind, and again, when we talk about population aging, what a what lot of people try to talk about a lot more is their vulnerability, their challenges. I think it is also very important to look at the contribution and the value that older people bring to our society's families. Um, you know, there is one statistics on HIV. When you look at the orphan and vulnerable children in Africa, a large majority of these orphans are cared for by their older grandparents. Uh, that is one example. If you look at small holding farmers, you know how Africa has its food security, it, it owes largely to the small holding farmers and majority of them are again older persons. And again, I can go on speaking. So I think as much we are talking about vulnerability of older persons in Africa, 
that they need support, I think it is very important that we also look at the capabilities that they bring. In fact, if you look at the informal economy, majority of the older persons, you know, up to 60 to 70 percent, and many of them are women, um, are, uh, are employed in the, in the informal sector. I think those are the, some of the con contributions they make. Uh, if, I, if I move on, um, you know, we, we negotiated and we worked on the sustainable development goals. And one of the key aspects of sustainable development goals is to leave no one behind, as we all know, and it was already mentioned from this podium. And when you look at, uh, and poverty is one of the biggest inequalities that exist in, in the world today. And if you look at uh, poverty rates, and this is just some example of some of the countries in Africa, um, if you look at Kenya, 57% of older people are, uh, are living with poverty. Uh, and Tanzania is 69% and so on. So when you look at uh, the national uh, poverty rates in these countries, older people are actually sometimes at the same level or higher than rest of the other age groups. But there is usually there is not a, lot, not a lot of mention and not a lot of focus on these population groups. Um, if I go into uh, another slide that looks at, uh, look, looks at uh, sickness uh, faced by older people, again, there is a, you can see already, I think it's probably an obvious thing, that older people tend to fall sick. Um, and this is, by the way, just uh, the common illnesses. If you take non-communicable diseases, that percentage increases probably much more. Uh, in fact, uh, Kenya, I think it will probably go to 60% of older people will be reporting, are reporting, uh, you know, have a, have a case of non-communicable disease when you talk about diabetes, uh, hypertension, arthritis, and so on. Um, now, uh, let me go to, I think already Madam Minister mentioned about uh, the importance of uh, social pensions, universal pensions. In Africa, I think I must say that governments are beginning to take a lot of attention. She mentioned the example from Senegal. And I have tried to give a sense of some of the social pension program that uh, goes on in the in the continent. Um, you know, some of the key ones. If I can, uh, if I can uh, speak about Zanzibar, the island of Zanzibar, started a universal old age pension for all older persons above 70 in the year 2016. Kenya has just started last year a universal pension for older persons. Uh, Malawi is do doing a feasibility study. And, uh, and uh, Zimbabwe uh, is also, Malawi has done a feasibility study, Zimbabwe is doing a feasibility study. Um, now, you know, I have traveled, I have, I have had the, the been very fortunate to travel in the Africa and, uh, and uh, you know, meet various policy makers and, uh, and government officials. One of the, one of the usual um, challenges that uh, I, I hear is that Oh, if we give money to older people, um, that is uh, just putting money in something that is not very productive. Now let's, and this is something that I tried to do it in a diagram, and it is based on the research done by HelpAge, and I work with HelpAge International and other organizations on impact of pensions, older person pensions, on, uh, on the wider community. Now on the left side, if, if an older person receives uh, a, a pension, uh, that person tends to increase her contribution in agriculture, her health-seeking behavior increases, she builds better houses and so on. But what is, I think that is obvious, of course you get money and you spend it on yourself, and that's great, they live better, I think that's an obvious thing to, to, to summarize. But what is also very, very important to look at is their contribution to the family, and this is, this is where I am giving it. When you get, a, an, an older person gets a pension, Usually the school enrollment goes up, and that this, the right side is the family. Girl children, especially in many countries where the pension has happened or other forms of social pension, the school enrollment of girl child has increased significantly um, in those places because the grandparents getting the pension have given it to their grandchildren, uh, especially daughters, to go to school. Household uh, savings have increased. And, and so on. I think there are under the food dietary diversity. They eat better. They eat different types of food. I think that's another indicator. Now, what is also important is the, the arrow that is there that goes back is because this person is giving back, they do not face the exclusion from the family. 
But they come in and the family starts to take care of them more. Uh, I think that's just what I wanted to show. Now, let's look at health and care. Um, I tried to just you know, be a very, very brief uh, slide here. When you look at older persons' health and care in Africa, you are looking at issues of access. And when you talk about access, it is social access, it is financial access, it's physical access, and their physical, you know, their capability to go to a health facility, how much, how far it is, and so on and so forth. Um, and that is a that's a significant challenge. And I will come to the financial access a bit, a bit later. Let's look at the issue of quality. I can, if I'm an older person in Africa, I might be able to go to a health facility, but more likely than not, I may not get the treatments that I, I need. Uh, I may have to wait there for three or four hours because the queue is very long. I think that's it. And of course, then you, you, you do not uh, tend to go there often, uh, as often as you fall sick. Awareness. Um, awareness of our uh, health workers. About, in fact, uh, Professor uh, said about you know, one recommendation I want to pick is the need for geriatric care. You'll be very surprised in Sub-Saharan Africa, in most countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, there is not even one geriatric specialist, not even one. Um, and then that is not something that we can deal with unless we build up that, that particular base. Uh, and data, uh, our, our, our formal healthcare systems continue to focus on uh, you know, not collecting data for older persons. In fact, data disaggregation as per age, sex, and disability is one of the key things that the Sustainable Development Goals have tried to um, advocate for. Um, now, the link between the two, I already mentioned, when somebody has social protection, social pension, their health-seeking behavior, their access to health, and their participation, because that person, not necessarily that that person suddenly becomes healthy, but that person tends to have a bit more capacity to seek help, come out of the house, and therefore, I, I mentioned to you that diagram before, when they feel included, the family also thinks that let's take care of this older person. That person is valuable to us, and let's also make sure that person is included. So I think those are some of the things I wanted to talk about. And again, we have done research in several countries, including in Malawi, and it clearly shows, though if you have to achieve Sustainable Development Goals 3, health, healthy age, health, health for all, you cannot, cannot have, cannot not talk about uh, social pensions and income security for older persons. Um, now I wanted to challenge a bit, uh, again from my discussions uh, and travel through the region, um, I have met, I have had the, you know, been very lucky to meet with very many policy makers, and, and I just tried to summarize it um, here. Um, why an African policymaker is unlikely to focus on older people? And I think you can read all those issues there. But one, I will just talk about one or two. One of the things that comes out often is many African governments, and rightfully, have declared that health is free for all. But is it? Let's, let's talk about it a bit, bit uh, more. Now, health is free, which is basically the health consultation is free. If I get to a clinic, um, if I had the money to take a transport, if I am able to um, get there, then that will be free. But then, as I said, if the drugs are not there, that's not exactly free if I have to go to the market outside. If I have to do some diagnostic tests and the, the government uh, health facility doesn't have the, doesn't have the laboratory, then I will, it's not exactly free. So it's, it's, it's not something that we'll be able to uh, talk about. Um, one of the other things that comes up is, you know, Africa is a youthful continent. And as I said, and I think there was, it came out, I was listening to another lecture this morning, this province, Kanagua, Kanagua province, right? This prefecture, Kanagua, Kanagua, sorry, my, my pronunciation, prefecture, where they said in 1970, the population pyramid of Kanagua was nice pyramid, uh, you know, with young people and like this. But in 2050, the pyramid is like this. So in Africa, as it has been said, we'll also get there. And uh, unless we start thinking about it more and more and, 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 and quickly. Um, let's, let's talk about uh, another one they say. That, oh, in Africa, um, we value our older people. Oh, everybody, I think there is, it's a common myth that we value our older people. Now, valuing your older persons should be not only by saying nice words that we value, but also backed up with policy and programmatic action. And I think that is something that we see increasingly.
and I don't want to talk, talk, talk about it more and uh, go to the next slide. Um, I think there's a lot of things there just in the interest of time. I think Japan, um, given the experience Japan has had in integrating population aging in your development, uh, is something, and we're talking about here in Tikar, and I think that's a real opportunity for Africa to learn from Japan. And, and with uh, the TICAD, I hope the collaboration between the two, two, two Japan and the continent will, will get stronger and we will be able to, um, we will be able to um, address the population aging and learn from each other a lot more. Um, I think I just wanted to say that. And, but before I conclude, a very fundamental issue I think we have to challenge and talk about. When we talk about the older persons, we also need to understand that we are also dealing with a very deep-seated behavior, what we call ageism. Ageism is, is a discrimination of somebody based on their age. Unless and otherwise, the same way racism and the same way sexism and all that, I think deep-seated there are people that feel that older persons are lesser human beings. And unless and otherwise we challenge that premise, that deep-seated behavior, we will not be able to address some of these things. And I hope we will be able to, the way Japanese society respects its elders and backs, up, backs it up with action, I hope in Africa we will also be able to do that. There is a lot of action already, and, and I hope that we will continue the, the trajectory of integrating population aging in our development. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Prafula, for the strong message. Let us now travel across continents from Africa to Asia, where Mr. Maliki from Indonesia will introduce us to approaches taken by an Asian country to address this issue. Mr. Maliki, please. Distinguished uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first uh, let me say I our appreciation for the opportunities to share our experiences on developing our policy on aging population. To begin with, uh, I think uh, unlike our uh, neighborhood countries such as Thailand, or Singapore, and Malaysia, Indonesia is actually in the preliminary stage of uh, aging population. Uh, Indonesia is still enjoying uh, the demographic dividend, uh, which is, is defined as uh, reaping the peak of the productive age group. And we are going to have the peak uh, maybe around next uh, five to 10 years uh, from now. However, in the same time, in the next uh, five years, uh, Indonesia will also experience uh, aging population. We are reaching 10% uh, of 60-plus uh, population appro approximately next year. And comparing uh, Indonesia and Africa, as you see from this graph, that uh, may be relevant uh, at some point, uh, not in the, uh, during the periods, but where the, actually the policy of demographic dividend is only defined as how actually to improve the skills of young productive age group and how to open more job opportunity for them. While we are, in, uh, we are forgetting uh, that improving productivity and also preparing old age welfare is on also one way to optimizing the demographic dividend. Uh, present challenges and opportunities for our current demographic transition is also of course in Indonesia. So, uh, In terms of percentage, our population uh, with age 60 and over is uh, is not reaching 10% uh, yet uh, in this year, and it is uh, it will be uh, a curse next year. Uh, but uh, size-wise, uh, our age population will be around uh, 30 million. Now it's 20 million, and it will be like 30 million uh, within the next few years. And in our uh, 100 years of independence. Uh, our age population will be appro approximately around uh, 60 million. Uh, that counts for 20% of total populations or around 3% of the uh, total world population. That is why uh, aging population is not uh, as a trade-in, but it also should be an opportunity for us. Our challenges are not only about the size, but also about the diversity. 
So uh, in 1929, uh, only a few provinces, as you can see here, that only a few provinces that experiences aging society. And in some other pl uh, uh, places, is quite young and they are still struggling on how actually to reach the better health access for the children and also high quality for the human capital. Well, in uh, 2045, when we uh, celebrate our 100 uh, independence, most of the provinces uh, experiences aging populations. Uh, but as you can see that the cultural also and geographical backgrounds will be a real challenge for us in adopting the same goal. Uh, because uh, we cannot adopt the, the, the same policy for the whole provinces to achieve one uh, more dignified elderly society. So uh, our challenge of population aging, I think, should be similar with other developing countries. While we have life expectancy is increasing, where the female elderly live longer, uh, it doesn't follow by uh, lengthening the healthy life expectancy. The female elderly will live longer, alone, and more vulnerable. Even though majority of elderly lives with their children, uh, but there are increasing trend of living alone, uh, elderly, uh, female elderly. Among the elderly itself, poverty is higher, as uh, already uh, also occurs in Africa. So our poor elderly is higher than 12%, uh, which is uh, higher than national level. When our poverty rates at national level has reached single digit, the rate of poverty of the poor people, of, of the elderly, is declining very slow. So elderly with disabilities also increasing, while uh, the coverage of the pension is also is not more than 15% for the elderly. And the elderly, both for the rich and the poor, both in also in urban and rural, still have to work to finance their consumption. While the rich people can depend partially from their uh, return on investment, the poor elderly heavily depends on the government support. And the elderly with disability is accelerated, especially for female elderly. Some of them have the national health insurance to cover with, but uh, its universal coverage is not. So it is shown that uh, only like almost 50%, uh, uh, more than 50% uh, of all the elderly are already covered by the national health insurance. So based on this condition, actually our law on elderly welfare is or has been promulgated in as early as 1998. However, the implementation is still relatively weak and also the strategy is not comprehensive. Uh, the policy handle the elderly as the object development, not as a subject. Therefore, the law is still failed to see the elderly as potential to contribute to a significant economic growth contributions. Therefore, uh, since last year, we are trying to improve and we also are formulating a national strategy to aim for better and productive elderly in the future. The elderly should become a role model for the young generation and also provide meaningful contribution to the community. There are a lot of evidence that female elderly is better means for government support to improve young generation quality. So our ultimate goal is to realize a prosperous, independent, and dignified elderly by building strong, competitive, and adaptive human capital in more integrated efforts. This will be implemented by creating more opportunities and better access for elderly. First is to strengthen capacity of the elderly yeah. Uh, and then the second one is to improve the welfare of the elderly and more importantly is actually to build a, a, a safe neighborhood for the elderly itself. So our national strategy will consist of five main uh, concentrated efforts. Uh, first is to build uh, the generational awareness. Build awareness in the community that aging process is a process to be embraced and also respected. So everyone will be aged, therefore we need to prepare. Second, here, is uh, to strengthen the institutional and regu uh, regulation arrangement. Strong coordination and implementation institution is needed, especially at the local context. Rega regulatory framework is also important for legal basis for all the stakeholders to work in the same issues. Third, is to uh, 
protect the elderly as early as possible. The social protection with uh, cover social assistance and also insurance-based uh, uh, social protection. Pension co uh, program and old age pension is the uh, effort to increase the coverage, especially in the informal sectors. Fourth, yeah. Uh, to increase health status, that is a very integrated effort that will affect all aspects. Uh, socialization, education, advocation has been quite intensive uh, for creating healthy, healthy lifestyles for all generations, which hopefully will also prepare for all age period. Last is how we should create a totally better uh, environment for respecting the rights of the elderly. So our strategy is a multi-stakeholder uh, effort. All, stack, uh, all sectors, all sectors have to be involved, and the intervention is based on the life cycle efforts. Uh, we have to intervene in the right time and as early as possible. As part of our uh, national strategy, uh, we acknowledge that there is a rapid uh, changing of lifestyles uh, in all generations. Our baby boomers was also born before uh, 97 are uh, uh, considered a sandwich generation. They live uh, with other two generations that live in totally different lifestyle and somehow uh, different norms. So we cannot really depend on the same living arrangement in the future, where children can provide care for their parents every day, especially with rapid uh, urbanization, where uh, children will not be able to live with their parents. They live in separate cities, and a lot of parents live apart from their children. So there is an increasing trend that uh, the living alone elderly in the rural area commit suicides uh, recently uh, because uh, of feeling lonely. So therefore, we are keen to develop more uh, comprehensive uh, social protection. That is including how we build elderly system and long care system as part of the elderly care system. The elderly care system is aimed to, uh, for more productive and active elderly so we are in the preliminary stage of building uh, a more systematic uh, community elderly care. So our first uh, effort is to integrate all programs that have been implemented by all stakeholders here. In the long term, now we plan to build an uh, insurance-based uh, long-term care system, and Japan is one of the best examples that uh, for us for benchmark. And from our experience uh, to share with African fellows is that aging pol uh, policy has to come as early as possible. And aging policy is a multi-stakeholder effort. Therefore, we need to uh, integrate, coordinate, and also harmonize the policy. And more challenge is how we can be consistent in implementing in the long term of the policy itself. So because the results will not be in this present time. Last, I would like to uh, thank uh, again for inviting me. We realize that we cannot claim our experiences will be successfully implemented and resulting the expected outcome. But one thing that we can emphasize here is that aging population is certain. So therefore our challenge is how to convince the policymakers to prepare this as early as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much Mr. Maliki for sharing us the experience from Indonesia. Now I would like to introduce our last but definitely not the least keynote speaker for today, Mr. Ken Masura from Nagasaki University, who is going to introduce us to the anthropological perspective of aging. Mr. Masura, please. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm, I was supposed to speak in English, but I, I was asked to speak in Japanese to guarantee the language diversity here. So as you see, uh, uh, this is written in Japanese and English and also French. So the, from now on, I'm going to speak in Japanese. Are you OK? Yes? I am Masada to the Nagasaki University of Global Health Education. I am a member of the Nagasaki University of Global Health Education. I am a member of the Nagasaki University of Global Health Education. I am a member of え、私はあの文化人類学者、え、25年余り、え、チョピアとケニアとで、え、活動してきた人類学者なんですが、え、人類学的にこの高齢者問題なアプローチするときに、え、いくつかのキーワードがあります。え、一つはフィールドワークを
ある出来事を観察したらそれを、えー、その社会のコンテクスト脈絡の中で理解しそして、えー、その社会動態ソーシャルダイナミクスですね社会の動きの中できちんと理解すること。そして、えー、人々が生活の中で培ってきた、えー、知識インディジナスノレッジを、えー、普遍的な知識との結びつきの中で理解するあるいはローカルな出来事をグローバルイシューに、えー、結びつける、えー、何よりも、えー、最後に、えー、Learning from Local Practice と書いてありますけど現地の人の実践というものからきちんと学ぶという、まあ、こういうアプローチで、えー、高齢者問題に取り組もうと考えています。えー、今日はいくつかの話題を提供しますが、えー、とりわけ大事なのはマクロな出来事とからミクロな出来事をいかにブリッジつなぐかということだと思います一つの例は、えー、この方です、えー、この方は、えー、この映像は2017年2年前に BBC で、えー、紹介されたビデオです、えー、ケニアの女性で、えー、テーマは彼女の117歳の誕生日を祝うというものでした、えー、なぜならば彼女の ID カードには彼女が西暦1900年生まれであるとえー、書いてあったんですね、えー、でそれが本当かどうかは<笑>分かりませんけれども、えー、面白いのは彼女の家庭です、えー、彼女は6人いる奥さんのうちの1人として、えー、ケニアのキクユ民族のチーフの奥さんでした子供が7人孫がたくさんひ、えー、孫がたくさんそしてとってもたくさんのヤシャコが現在いるこれは何を意味するかというと5世代が同時にこの世に存在しているということでこれは人類史上おそらく初めてのことですこういうことはつまりそれだけ人々が長生きするようになりなおかつ子供もまだたくさん生まれているという、えー、こういう人口動態の中に今の世界があるということをまず理解してほしいと思います、えー、アフリカの人口の増加と、えー、高齢化率の変化についてはすでに多くのパネラーが紹介してくださいましたので、えー、多くは言いません人口が増えることと今世紀末には高齢者比率が高くなるとサブサハラアフリカの1950年の高齢者比率は 5% 現在、あまり変わりません 5% ですこれは60歳以上ですが今世紀末には基準を65に上げても 13.3 というふうに高齢者従属比率もこれだけの数字になると。ちなみに同じ時の、えー、今世紀末のエチオピアの数値がこれで、えー、エチオピアは他の国に比べてとりわけ、えー、高齢化の進行が進むと言われています、えー、なぜエチオピアを言うかというと私はずっとエチオピアで、えー、活動してきまして、えー、実は英語よりもあのア,ムアムハラ語とかバンナ語っていうのはエチオピアの言葉の方があの得意なんですじゃあ私が今までアフリカで会ってきた高齢者を何人か紹介したいと思います、えー高齢者を取り巻く状況は決して安定しているわけではない常に揺れ動いているというふうに、えー、お考えください、えー、この写真はケニアのキベラというスラムです、えー、スラムなんですが人口が100万人を、えー、超えています私が住んでいる長崎の人口は40万人ですのでそれよりはるかに大きな、えー、人口を抱えたスラム、えー、昨年私たちが会ったこの女性は、えー、59歳ということで高齢者のカテゴリーには厳密には入らないのですが、えーまあ、あの生活はほぼお一人で、えー、ポイントとしてはです、ねえー、赤ちゃんを育てているんですねただしこの赤ちゃんのお母さんが誰であるかは分かりません、えー、ある若い女性からこの赤ちゃんを託されてそのまま育てていると。えー、ス,スラムですので貧困地域でお互いにみんなで支え合いながら、まあ、暮らしているそういう中に高齢者が暮らしているという状況が一つあります、えー、これらの写真はケニアのクアレというところで、えー、私たちが今始めようとしている研究地ですけれども、えーえー、およそ 5% の高齢者比率それから多くの高齢者が、まあ、家族のサポートによって暮らしていますが中には、えー、ここにスケープトジェネレーションハウスホールドという。えー、お年寄りがお孫さんの面倒を見るという生活形態が多く見られます、えー、こちらはエチオピアです、えー、エチオピアの首都アディスアベバで撮った写真ですが、えーまあ、私の家族みたいなもんです、えー、こちらの女性はエチオピア南部の、えー、町で数十年ずっと暮らしてきましたがあ夫が亡くなりえー、そして現在は首都に移住してきました、えー、高齢者は1か所にずっと住むわけではなくて実はいろんな事情により移動しながら暮らすんですね、えー、でこの女性はアディスアベバに暮らしながら、えー、お孫さんたちの世話をしながら、まあ、あの老後を送っています同じエチオピアのアディスアベバでは、えー、ここ近年ですが、えー、路上で生活する、えー、ホームレス高齢者が、えー、増えています、えー、これらの方々についてはある NGO が
ここに書いてますね、えー、この NGO が、えー、高齢者を路上から、まあ、救出してですねで生活の場を与え、えー、身切れにして、えー、ヘルスケアをチェックをしてそして、えーまあ、身元が分かれば、えー、実家に送り届けるという活動をしています、えー、とこの団体は、えー、ヘルプエイジインターナショナルから、えー、多くのサポートを、えー、得ていますえー、そうやって収容されたあお年寄りの方です、えー、この方は実は言葉が私と違うので会話はできなかったんですけれども、えー、この収容施設で実に楽しそうに暮らしています、えーえー、場所は変わってタンザニアのザンジバルという島で私が最も仲良くして、えー、くださもらっているおじいさんは、えー、サンダル屋のおじいさんです、えー、もともと警察官でその後退職してサンダル屋を経営し今は引退していますがいつも玄関先に座ってサンダルをやっています、えー、縫っています、はいえー、アクティブなんですねでつまり、えー、店の経営の一線から退いても実に楽しそうそして大何より大事なのはご近所さんからこの人はとても敬われていて、えー、ここに、えー、とインポータントムゼーと書いてありますスワヒリ語で、まあ、長老ですね、えー、そして認識されている、まあ、社会的にきちんと認知されている、えー、場所ですえー、この方は、えー、先ほども紹介したクアレというところのおじいさんですが、えー、私、今までに2回会ってます4年前に会った時初めて4年前ですね4年前に初めて会った時、えー、このおじいさん、MM さんは第一、えーえー、長男、三男、四男の家庭と農村地域で大きなコンパウンドを築いてその中で暮らしていましたただし、このおじいさんの住んでいた家はちょっと粗末な小屋で、えー、実は鶏と同居してました。えー、おじいさんが鶏と同居しているのか鶏がおじいさんと同居しているのか、まあ、そういう、えー、状況で暮らしていたんですが、えー、昨年行ったらです、ね大えー、次男ですね次男のお家に引き取られていました、えー、これも農村地帯といえどもおじいさん、おばあさんは同じところに一箇所してずっとじっと暮らしているわけではないということの一つの印だと思われます、えー、もうほとんど終わりです、えー、私のエチオピアの両親です人類学者はフィールドに長く暮らしますので現地の人々と疑似的な家族関係を結びますが、えー、彼が私のおじいさんでおすみませんおじいさんじゃないですお父さんで、えー、90代あちらが私のエチオピアの母で70代です、えー、どちらもこの南部出身ではなくてお,、えー、お父さんはエチオピアの北部の方からゾウのハンティングをするために南部に来てそのまま居着きましたお,お母さんはこのおじいさんと結婚するために、えー、南部にやってきましたそしてずっとここで暮らしています、えー、こういう方々の生活のケアについて今までいろんな、えー、お話をいただきました、えー、実はここにあるように高齢者に対するケアの、えーまあ、システムといいましょうか仕組み、まあ、あるいは全体的な成り立ちというものはいくつもの層の重なり合いでできていますこれは日本でもそうです、えー、一番近いところでは、まあ、自分すみませんえー、自分で何とかするあるいは家族のケアに守られるあるいは近,人近,、えー、近隣のサポートによって生活するそれより上になりますとよりパブリックな、えー、公的なセクターで例えば、えー、ここに LTC とあるのは、えー、ロングタームケア、えー、長期介護ですね長期介護のパブリックな、えー、行政的なサポートを得ながら暮らす。えー、あるいはもう,もうちょっと言いますとこちらにありますが例えば年金、まあ、こういうようないろんないくつもの支援のネットワークの中に、まあ、お年寄りの暮らしが位置づけられる、えー、こちらがあればあいいですけどもない場合にはこちらの中で何とかしなきゃいけないというそのどういう層の中でお年寄りが生きているかという現実をフィールドワークを通して見るということが必要になるわけです、えー、このマクロからマイクロへのつながり方というものに、えーえー、私たちはこうグローバルイシューとしてグローバルエイジングを考えますけれども同時に、えー、フィールドで起きている出来事というものを現地の脈絡の中で、えー、しっかり理解することが必要です、えー、最後になりますがあ一つのもう一つの例を紹介して私のお話を終わりたいと思います、えー、一体国家が作るナショナルポリシーとそして、えー、人々が暮らすローカルカルチャーの間にはどのようなギャップがあるだろうかなぜこういう問いが発生するかといいますとアフリカの国々には多くの文化的多様性があるわけですしたがって国家は制定するポリシーと現地で行われてきた、えー土着のケアのやり方の間に、えー、差が起きる可能性がありますというかあります、えー、あるはこの知人この知人というかこのおじいさんはもう15年ぐらい前亡くなりましたが、えー、言ってました、えー、バンナという民族で私がずっと暮らしてきたあのテント暮らしをしてきた村ですけども、えー、そこのおじいさんは我々バンナ人には人生のモデルは一つしかないと、ね
、ね、畑を耕し家畜を飼いそして、えー、正しかるべき儀式を経て結婚して子供を産んで年を取って死ぬこれしかないと、ね、だから学校なんか必要がないという主張をされていましたこのモデルの中で生きていく人たちがナショナルウェルフェアポリシー、えー、国家の福祉政策の中で位置づけにくいですね,ね、えー、このおじいさんは、えー、2年前に亡くなりました、えー、バンナのリチュアルリーダー、えー、と儀礼的な市長で、まあ、王様と言ってもいい方です、えー、6人奥さんがいて、えー、最晩年は第一夫人と第六夫人の間を行ったり来,なし来たりしながら暮らしていました、えー、2年前に亡くなりましたが、えー、私はこの方が死んだことをフェイスブックで知りました、えーえー、その死がフェイスブックでアナウンスされた初めてのバンナですえー、もう一人、GA さん、この方は私は会ったことがありません、私が初めてここに来たときにはもう亡くなってました、えー、この方は奥さんが1、2、3人いまして、えー、これだけたくさんの子供がいました。えー、この中の第二夫人という方を私は何度か間近で見ていたんですがこの第二夫人のお母さんは夫が亡くなった後住む場所はですね自分の両妻つまり、えー、彼女はセカンドワイフなんですがファーストワイフの子供の家あるいは自分の子供の家ある時はここに住みある時はここに住みある時はここに住みと住む場所は安定しませんでしたが行った先々で必ず何か仕事をしていました。この写真はこのの写写真真ははそ時、えー食べ,食べた羊の皮をなめしているところです、えー、人々が年を取るということにどういう意味があるのかそれを、えー、いいことと捉えるあるいは悪いことと捉えるその文化によって解釈が違います、えー、このバンナの人たちの村では男たちはみんなで肉を食うときにはテーブルを囲みません横一列に並びます一番右端に座っているのは高齢者そして順々に年齢が下がっていってここに子供が座っています私はだいたいこの辺なんですけども、はい、一番右足に座っていた、えー、これは21年前に撮った写真ですこのお年寄りたちは今もう全員この世にはいません彼らに年を取ることについて聞いてみるといろんなことを言ってきます一般的にはこういう言い方をしますインタゲッチリニーバンナ語で I got old 私は年を取ったでそのことについていろんな言い方があります例えばゲッチャムのシアニー Getting older is bad 年を取ることは悪いことだという言い方をしたりしますでもある人はすごく幸せそうな顔をしてゲッチャムのパイアネゲッティングオーダーイズナイス年を取ることはとてもいいことなんだつまり一つの文化の中でも年を取るということに対する受け止めはいろいろありますそれを良いこととして捉えられる社会を、えー、彼らは何とか作り上げようとしてきてそういうローカルな実践からどのように学ぶことができるのかそうやって学んだことをどのように国家やあるいは行政の政策の中にうまく組み込めるのかというところが人類学者としての問題意識ですありがとうございました The panel discussion will be conducted in English, so please switch to the channel of your preference. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? And、uh, my name is Reiko Hayashi. I'm the moderator of this panel session. I'm from National Institute of Population and Social Security Research. So, for the speaker's talk, we ask to each to, to, to have the language diversity. And then now to talk between. Between us, we decided that we are going to do it in English. So,、um, many of you might have thought that why we are talking about aging in this TICAT, the African context. 
And then as already the speaker has talked about, it is becoming an emerging issue, although the proportion of the old people are small yet, the number of elderly is increasing. In 20 years, it will be two times more. In 30 years, it will be three times more older people living in Africa because the population itself is increasing. So if there are more older people, then there are more need for the medical care and long-term care. So this is one topic which we have been hearing from four speakers about medical care. As Professor Awamari Korsek have mentioned, that although that there is this um, medical care, health care is now expanding, but there, still there is a lot of lack in providing health care for older people. Although, as, uh, as Dr. Prafra have mentioned, that old, when you get older, you have more diseases. So maybe I would like to ask the Indonesian situation, how you dealt with increasing mobility and then diseases for the older people in Indonesia before coming to the long-term care system itself. And then also for the long-term care, um, maybe this is the part which is less developed in Africa, but um, as Professor Auer have mentioned slightly, but maybe um, I, have, I have saw in some text that uh, there is the elderly facility, retirees facilities, and then is there what kind of long-term caregiving setting which is already existing in Senegal, and then is it on the way to be developed or not? And then maybe if, um, if Dr. Prafra might have the same, um, the, can, can share us with the situation of long-term care, for example, the bedridden elderly. And then when we talk about this um, development of long-term care system, then we cannot escape from family issues. So that is what Professor Masuda have talked about this family structure, and then there is this value, and then also Professor Awa have talked that elderly in Africa is like the cement of the family. And then also when one older people die, it is like burning one library. And then this value is also changing. And then also there might be, in the case of Indonesia, there are increasing number of elders living alone. Is this the case for Africa? And then also um, Professor Masda have talked about that uh, there is the homeless elderly in Africa. So, and then also there is the changing value of family. For example, in the case of Japan, we are the most aged society in the world, and we have now having the long-term care insurance since 2000. And when we introduce the long-term care insurance, there is a harsh discussion whether we should pay for the family, especially the first son's wife, who were in, ch in charge of taking care of, his, uh, of her parents-in-law. But then we decided not to introduce this family allowance for the long-term care, because if we pay cash, to the, to, the, to the woman in the family, then we might give the pressure to this woman to stay at home and then to do the care for the elderly. And then that is how we have introduced the long-term care insurance. That is how we have tried to move the long-term care from family to the social sphere. So is this thing can be the parallel thing in Africa or not? What is the, the, the family role and then how the family is considered to offer the care? Is it too much for, especially in, term, in consideration of gender issues? So um, these are the questions which I now address to the four speakers. I will pass the microphone to get the answer. But after that, I, will, I want to open the floor to have some questions and comments from you. So if you have some questions and comments, please be prepared. So, uh, maybe I pass the microphone from uh, Dr. Prafa. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Rico, again. Uh, you, you have asked me a question to reflect on long-term care in, um, in Africa. Uh, you know, long-term care as a, as a, as a concept uh, is not very well, well understood in the continent. Uh, um, you know, there is a favorite or a very common 
expression you would hear, oh, we take care of our older people and they're in their families. Uh, but that, 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 that is not the truth uh, because uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges that we face. So data, when you look at national level data on how many people, just the statistics of how many people out of the world who require long-term care, the data is not existing for most countries. But there's some data that is uh, available from WHO about three, four years back. If I give an example of Ghana, Ghana, if you look at persons requiring um, some sort of an assistance in, in daily life or uh, in, in living uh, in their daily life, it's about between 65 to 75 age group, population uh, people who are old, 65 to 75, 50% of them are requiring that kind of assistance. And that number is 65% uh, above the age of 75. So there's a large number of older people in Africa are requiring assistance, um, you know, in, in, in managing the daily life. If just, to, just to give you a reference, uh, let's look at Switzerland, a great place to be. Um, old in, I guess, and uh, yes, in Japan as well. In Switzerland, about uh, between 5 to 20% 20, 20 of older people above the age of 70 are uh, requiring some sort of uh, assistance. Um, so that, that itself is a big challenge. Um, now, the other reflection I would share is when we look at, um, when we say that it is the role of the family, it is the responsibility of the family to take care of the older persons, now that becomes a burden. Uh, huge burden because most of the time the family itself has you know their you know well-being is a big is a key question and uh, so there is a lot of rights violation again we have done a lot of studies in many countries there's a lot of violation of rights of older people um, happens at the at the family level because uh, they just think that it's a burden um, that they are dealing with there is some I, I must not always uh, you know speak about uh, I am an optimist by nature and so I want to talk a bit about the, about the positive. It is beginning to be recognized as an issue. And, uh, and uh, in fact, the African Union has uh, last year come up with a, something called a Africa Common Position on Long-Term Care. And that has just come out. Uh, it's, a, it's a document that is, you know, intends to bring in that integration, I think that Professor Masuda mentioned, between family, nascent states, and individuals. How do we sort of bring it together? That's, um, that's something uh, positive, and we hope it will be rolled out um, ahead. Um, so, thank you. Then, Professor Masuda. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the why I am interested in the elderly issue in Africa, the answer is uh, like this. So that I'm teaching the, at the Tropical Medicine and Global Health School at Nagasaki University. And also, uh, my students used to focus on the infectious diseases like malaria, yeah. HIV, AIDS, like this. But as a result of the rapid health improvement in Africa, so now that you know, the, the life expectancy is growing like this. So you know, we are expecting the you know, future population aging after so that's why I'm just on this. So uh, now the focus on the uh, LTC, so the, I participated in the uh, International Conference of uh, Gerontology uh, Study of Elderly People, uh, I think uh, two years ago. So a lot of policy makers uh, can get together from all over Africa, uh, some are from Minister of Health, some are from Minister of Health. So uh, there are some countries uh, still uh, have already started uh, in, the, in making a new policy. But the most of the policy makers is also you know, expecting informal care. Yeah. So the, the family care uh, is so important. And also, uh, still now, you know, many people are expecting the family care, even though the policy makers uh, are you know, trying to make a new plan. So this is the uh, Africa uh, now. So the, the, the how to integrate or include the peripheral and the abandoned people living in you know, the rural area in Africa, that depends on, the, for example, the rapid growth in the economic status and also educational status. This is not just a medical issue, not just a peripheral issue. This is kind of the holistic matter. So as Kolsek uh, told us, uh, it means the holistic approach, you know, having the wide scope in covering the, this matter, this matter, this matter. A lot of things must be paid attention. Uh, 
Thank you. I would like to just uh, ensure that uh, we are uh, all in agreement that uh, in Africa we don't have one story. It's several stories, but we have a common uh, ground, which is the issue of how family is really uh, taking care and uh, all the traditional way uh, saying that family is taking care completely of uh, elders is uh, not something we need to uh, say that it is existing completely. When I here, everybody, it seems to me that the situation we have in Senegal is the one we have in Ethiopia, we have in Kenya, in Indonesia. Uh, we all would like the family to take care. But the family will not be able to do that if she's not the family, it is not, it is not supported. And how to do that is really where the uh, holistic approach is important. Because we cannot consider that uh, we help them only on uh, medical issues. Sure, they have more uh, problems of health, but they, are, they have also problems of uh, consideration, how their people are taking care of them, how people are behaving. Sometimes you can be in a family, maybe we ha don't have a lot in the town, in road, in because uh, of the speciality, but we have some people who are uh, older who are in uh, a family and nobody knows that they are there. I have my own experience in the where I am uh, living, where I have decided like this because I knew that some people were sick and some were older people, never in structures. And I decided to organize an NGO where we are going to look at old people in their family. And it is a lot. And we never saw them because we, we were thinking that they don't exist. So this is a way to show also that the issue of discrimination exists now in Africa. The second point I would like, I was very happy to, to hear the issue of cash transfer. Because in Senegal we are doing cash transfer but for women, not for old people. And this issue may be look at. Because when they have some money, they have more power. Because when they are completely dependent, uh, at the end, people are sometimes tired to do everything for them, etc. And if they have some money they can have themselves, uh, it seems to be that this will give them again the place they deserve. Uh, for the long term, also, uh, it is difficult uh, if you don't have social services or NGOs at community level, supporting countries with all the people. Because for the long term, uh, if they are sick, they need some home care, all these things uh, need to be organized. But I want to, to say that uh, this is new for us, very new. We have some uh, projects, we have some strategies, but uh, the plan of action is now very clear, but we, we realize that uh, we need to learn from others, uh, which is why I, I think that all the questions you raise are important because we need to learn, and I would like to ask for uh, all the PowerPoint presentation, if possible, to ensure that we will be listening people, but we have also all this PowerPoint existing for us. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, in terms of the international and the long-term care itself has been uh, officially 
build. Uh, and we are trying to uh, design this uh, as well as how we can also have the opportunity to have uh, community base as well as the uh, instruments based uh, long term care itself. Uh, however, uh, recent, I mean, in the, a few years uh, and also in the future, uh, some uh, local initiatives have been already uh, existed. Uh, some of the uh, local government that already aware that, uh, that uh, there's a lot of uh, elderly people uh, in the community and is not uh, being having enough uh, attention from the uh, government support. So they have uh, they also create some programs that are related uh, to the care of the elderly itself. Uh, and this is a more uh, integrated effort between the, the sectorals, uh, like uh, at least there are three uh, sectors that work on this uh, local initiative. There is uh, health uh, sectors and also the social sectors. And one is the more important is the family planning uh, 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 initiatives. The family planning itself is, has a very, a very important uh, role because they uh, have a programs on how uh, the family members is strengthened, uh, the capacity of the family members to taking care of the elderly. So, so these uh, three uh, major uh, three major uh, sectors is uh, working well together in some of the local uh, uh, government, especially for the local government who have uh, more uh, uh, li uh, uh, liberty on the financial uh, capability. Like some provinces are in Java Islands as well as Bali, they have quite uh, uh, well uh, fiscal uh, capabilities, so they can give more attention on the elderly uh, care. Uh, in terms of uh, what uh, our national level uh, is uh, trying to do is how we can actually define more uh, uh, acceptable uh, long-term care system itself, because now. Uh, some in our in our stakeholders, some of the academicians, also all the experts, and uh, some of the line ministers also is not yet agreed what is actually the long-term care uh, uh, system defined in our in our uh, at, at the national level. Uh, so uh, uh, this is our. our, our Thank you very much. So there are new issues such as we need data and then also LTC, long-term care, is something very new. And uh, along with assisting the family who care, we have many challenges to do. But now the time is limited, but I want to open the floor. So um, is there anybody, if you have some questions and comments, please raise your hand. あの、高齢者の例とかあるんですけれども、あの、ケニアのスラムの事例で紹介されたような、そういったあの都市部の高齢者を世話するような、特に地域の力というのが必要だなという強く感じています。え、まああの私どもですね、こういったことはあの、まあ日本のあの、えっと、まあ高齢者、地域
and uh, how to build up the um, systems between learning each other, it is very important. So I would like quickly move to the closing remarks, which will be made by uh, the area Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia representative, Dr. Komazawa. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. I think uh, Dr. Reiko already wrapped up, so I don't have to make closing remarks here, but uh, <laughs> I'm supposed to make a very brief closing remarks. And uh, on behalf of the co organizers, I'd like to appreciate your participation and interest in this event. And I think we could we succeed to provide a very good, one of the very few opportunities to have a dialogue with Asia and Africa and population. And uh, as, as actually myself has been involved with both with Asia and Africa, so it is a very interesting event. And uh, I'm from area, you can see our logo, the second from the left. That is the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. We are based in Jakarta, and our mission is the uh, policy recommendation to ASEAN Secretariat. So you must be wondering why area is one of the co-organizers of this event. So let me talk about my own experience to explain, to answer this question. And uh, actually, I had an activity in Africa when I was a PhD candidate of Nagasaki University, that is also one of the co-organizers. Uh, we had the uh, project to establish a, a demographic surveillance system, surveillance system in rural Kenya. And I stayed in a very remote fishery village in Lake Victoria. And uh, according to our database, the population of that island was 1,000. But the population of uh, 60 plus people was only about 10, I think. So it's, it's one person. And uh, I, I never, I think at that time, I never discussed focus on aging in the, in the project. And actually, I had activities in Vietnam. And I stayed in an ethnic minority village in mountainous Vietnam region. And uh, I participated in the malaria control project. So if you have been engaged in the, some health development project, you, you, you know the target of malaria control project is child. So we almost ignore the older people in the country. So it is very impressive event for me that Asia and Africa have a dialogue with population. So now you are in Japan. So as you know, the Japan is the, the most aged country in terms of population structure. The proportion of 65 plus is uh, over 35 percent. It will reach 30 percent soon. So I believe even in Japan, the older people are respected uh, because they have a very rich experiences and knowledge, and uh, they built the well fine skills, and they have a very good insights on the credit and everything. So even in Japan, I, I believe they are all respected, but. You can find uh, some communities if you look around Japan. That, for example, the, all of the community members are 65 plus, and uh, in such societies, it's very common that an older person is taken care of by an older person, and the result is in tragedy. And uh, even abuse, as, as uh, Professor Brakula uh, said, uh, it, it is taking place in Africa. Abuse of uh, older people is. Uh, you may think that is an ex extreme example of the most aged country, but I think the world is aged, the world population is aged, because it's a natural consequence of the human development. So if the 2030 agenda for sustainable development is achieved in the future, the world will certainly have the society with population aged. So I think this kind of dialogue is very important because uh, the solution for population is, is not only one, 
there are very many strategies to cope with population growth. So we have to find and create a new opportunity from population gaining rather than cultural importance. So ladies and gentlemen, distinguished excellency, population aging the success of humanity. So we have, if we want to enjoy achievement of 2030 agenda for sustainable development, now we have to prepare for the era which will certainly have population aging. And uh, I, I hope this event will be considered in the near future as a spearhead of the, such a movement to discuss on how humanity copes with population aging and how we can enjoy the benefit of extra lives of years we will acquire uh, as a result of human development. So finally, I'd like to appreciate the great contribution of honorable members of the big award. And of course, the dedicated work of the Japan Center for International Exchange uh, must be and thank you very much, distinguished guests, Excellency, and ladies and gentlemen, for the, your participation in this event. And uh, I hope uh, to see you again. And thank you very much. I'd like to call uh, the receiver on your seats and please make sure to have all personal belongings with you when you leave the hall. Thank you very much again.